guys, welcome to the Vertical Life Church online experience. I'm Kelly and I'm so excited to welcome you to our global community. We want to awaken and empower you in your walk with Jesus. And so we're gonna bring you some powerful worship and an awesome message. Check it out. Righteous, you are holy, you are worthy of praise. We lift up your name, Jesus. God Almighty, we lift you up. Be glorified here this morning. Be glorified here this morning. Oh yeah, we love you, we love you, we love you.
that. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Let everything, Let everything that, has breath. that has breath. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Let everything, Let everything that, has that has breath. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Let everything, Let everything that, has breath. that has breath. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Come on, let's praise. I praise Him. Praise because you're true. Praise because there's nobody greater than you. 
All right, no matter where you find yourself this morning, put on that garment of praise this morning. One voice, one heart. This isn't hype. This is the Bible. This is scripture. This is saying that God is worthy of all praise and he inhabits those praises. His manifest presence arrives and shows up when there's genuine praise. What is genuine praise? The most genuine praise is the praise that happens when you don't feel like it. That is faith right there. I don't feel like it, but I know he's worthy. So we're going to sing it again. Connect your heart with it this morning. I praise because you're sovereign. Praise because you reign. Praise because you rose and defeated the grave. I praise because you're faithful. Praise because you're true. Praise because there's no praise this morning. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you.
would you just lift those hands this morning? Just take a moment and let thankfulness rise from your heart. Thank you, Jesus, for the blood. We remember this morning. We remember this morning. We remember the price that was paid. We remember the stripes. We remember the crown. We remember the nails. We remember the spear. We remember this morning. We remember this morning. We remember this morning. It's by your blood. Come on, thank him. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. We remember. And with gratitude and thanksgiving, we come. All the access that we've been given this morning. The access to come in this morning. The access to come in this morning. Thank you, Jesus. You're worthy. Come on, just say that. You're worthy. Worthy is the Lamb. Worthy is the Lamb. Let your hearts just rest in that. Worthy is the Lamb. response this morning. This is our response this morning. Worthy is the Lamb. Worthy is the Lamb. Worthy is the Lamb.
We're so glad to have you as a part of our online family today. We couldn't put on this experience without your generosity and support. If you'd like to partner with us as we continue to spread the gospel, there are two ways that you can give at Vertical Life. You can text any amount to 84321, or you can go to verticallife.info and click give. We believe that God has something awesome to teach us today, so let's prepare our hearts as we continue in our service with an awesome message. Good morning, everyone. My name is Joel. I serve on the media team. And we're going to be in Colossians 3, 1 through 17 today. If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears then you also will appear with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. In these you too once walked when you were living in them, but now you must put them all away, anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. Here there is not Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, but Christ is all and in all. Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another. And if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other, as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body. And be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. This is the word of the Lord. Good morning. All right. That was a long section of scripture, was it not? So uh, we're going to, as you can, as you see, we're going to continue in our series in Colossians where we're just walking through this letter um, section by section and seeing how we can apply it to our life. And uh, last week we talked about how the Apostle Paul was uh, calling us to return to relationship. You know how we, at, we tend to have a, a, a habit of adding to what Jesus has already done for our salvation. And uh, just to remind you, I think it's good to remind us what Paul is dealing with in this church is where he's trying to bring clarity to what it means to be a Christian. He's, br- he's bringing clarity to the understanding that Jesus's work was complete and there's nothing that we can do to, to add to it. Whereas Jews were coming in and trying to add to it. Pagans maybe been trying to add to it. And it was a little bit of a mixture of what it looks like to follow Jesus. Now, what I tend to see a lot of times is that what, just because Paul addressed the reality of that, hey, you don't add to the complete work of Jesus doesn't excuse us and, and give us permission to live however we want to live. You know, there's a call to sanctification. Everyone say sanctification. And when any time I'm in a culture where I hear the message of grace taught without a call to sanctification, for me personally, a flag goes up. I'm, I want to pay attention because because when you are in proper relationship with Jesus and you're in proper relationship communing with the, the Holy Spirit, there should be change in your life. It should be evident in your life that you're in relationship with the Holy Spirit. Would you agree with me? To me, I believe that if the Holy Spirit truly dwells and abides in you, it would be proper to expect fruit from your life. But what we 
often think is that we have no role or responsibility to play in partnering with the Holy Spirit and following his leadership in our life and making sure that we see the fruit in our life of that relationship. So Paul's going to address this here. And I, I think what he's addressing is sanctification. And so we'll start off here in Colossians chapter 3, verse 1. Paul says this, if, everyone say if. If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. So the first question is, does this apply to everyone? No, it applies to who? Those who've been raised with Christ. And so he's, he's speaking to Christians and he's saying that if if you have really truly been born again, then there should be a change in your life because a new birth means there's a new life. Would you agree with me on that? If there's no new life, you do have to question if there truly was a new birth. And so he's saying that, hey, if you truly have been raised with Christ, then what you pursue, what you go after in your life should change and look drastically different than the rest of the world. Would you agree with me on that? And see, the concern is, is that often Christians look no different than the rest of the world. Get divorced at the same rate, chase the same things, have anxiety over the same issues, depressed as everyone else. In some ways, there's really no difference. And so the question is, hey, have I been truly born again or am I not yielding to the leadership of the Holy Spirit in my heart? He's dealing with the heart here. And that when you give your life to Christ, there should be a reorientation in your life around the things of the kingdom. It doesn't mean, hear me out, it doesn't mean you don't pursue other things. It doesn't mean that you don't go make money and provide for your family and do those things. It means it's in the right priority in your life. That your pursuit is first, I seek first what? The kingdom of God. That we're not like, he, Matt, Jesus says, don't be like the Gentiles who seek after all these other things. That you and I are supposed to be those who seek after the kingdom of God. So the priority in our life is to manifest his kingdom. The priority of our life is to pursue the things that his heart is after. And it's the right priority in our life. And what I tend to notice sometimes is people don't, they don't, it's not ill-willed or intentional but we chase after good things and we make them the priority of our life. And any good thing in the wrong priority of your life will put you out of alignment and put your life in the form of perversion because you're living outside of design. Do you follow me? And this is how it looks. I'll give you a practical example. You are pursuing the Lord and he's changing your life drastically. Your family is blossoming, you're growing, things are changing in your life. And then a job situation changes where you have an opportunity to move your family to another area, to another state, where you have no connections or no relationships, and you do that instead. Now, I'm not saying that God might not be calling you, but when you make the priority of your life, your progress in the corporate world, and not the growth of your family and your children, you're out of design. Do you follow me? that the first priority of your life is I seek the kingdom of God. I seek his heart, not only for my life, but for my family's life. And so Paul is saying here that if you are born again, there should be a reorientation of your life and you no longer look like everyone else. In fact, I think this is kind of sad. Gallup and Barna, they did a survey and it says that they got survey after survey show that evangelical Christians are as likely to embrace lifestyles every bit as hedonistic, materialistic, self-centered, and sexually immoral as the world. Like, there's no difference. Why? Because I think a lot of times our commitment to Jesus is just something external and our heart is going after other things. And what God wants is your heart. In some translations, in fact, this section of scripture says, sets your heart on the things that are above. 
It's what you're giving your affections to. So a lot of times on the outside, we look like we're following God, but in reality, our affections, our heart, we're giving it to other things. And I'll unpack that here in a little bit. But notice what he says next. He says in verse two, he says, set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on the earth. And so now what he's doing is, what I believe he's doing is he's bringing alignment to our life. He's saying, hey, if your heart has been born again, now let's bring the rest of your life into alignment with what's going on in your heart. Do you follow me? And so the first thing he says is set your minds on the things above. See, it begins with our thoughts. And the question is, what have you set your thoughts on? Like, what do you constantly think about? You know, I, I was listening to this uh, world-renowned therapist, and she was talking about the mind, and she was talking about how the mind is, all it is is a tool. It's, and, and what it does, its job is to make reality whatever thoughts it has. Because if you think about it, have you ever analyzed your own thoughts Anyone? So that means you're not your mind, right? If you're able to analyze your own thoughts, that means you're not your mind. So your mind is just a tool to bring to reality, to manifest whatever you give to it. And she used this analogy, I think it was a great example. She said, if you, if you would close your eyes, I'm not asking you to do this. Um, if you would close your eyes and just imagine and picture a very ripe lemon in front of you. And let's just say you smell it, you smell the lemon, you cut it in ha half, and then you lick the lemon. How many of you, some of you in your mouth already started getting kind of weird, right? Or, or, or uh, Sour Patch Kids or Lemon Heads, you know, you suck on those things and your mouth gets all crazy. What's, what's strange is your, your, your body doesn't know if it's real or not. Your body is just taking the information I just provided you and causing your body to respond to it. Do you follow me? It's manifesting whatever thoughts you place into it. And so what Paul was telling us is that if you want a fruitful life, your first job is to make sure the thoughts that you're entertaining, what you set your mind upon are from things above and not things on the earth. You know, the reality is that sometimes, I don't know if you do this, but if you, you, you constantly think about wanting something, maybe it's a, a pair of new shoes, or maybe it's something you found on Amazon, or maybe it's on some website, and you just kind of think about it, think about it, think about it, think about it. Next thing you know, that item is actually in your cart, but you don't buy it yet, right? You just kind of hold off. Anyone, come on, anyone with me? You buy it. Your Amazon cart might be filled with all kinds of things, and sometimes you forget to remove those things, you hit buy, and oh no, why, why did those vitamins cost $300? And you're like, because you forgot to remove all these other items. But, but what happens is the thing, as you dwell upon something, your mind is doing its job and it's going to make it a reality in your life. So if you constantly dwell on buying that item, it's going to make it to your car and then you're eventually you're just going to buy it. And so what we need to do is we need to pay attention to the things that we're thinking about. What do you think about? What do you dwell upon? If you dwell upon being rejected all the time, then what's going to happen? Your body is going to manifest that. If you dwell upon anxiety and worry and fear, what's going to happen? Your body is going to manifest that. If you dwell and think only about the American dreams all the time, I'm not saying it's bad, but I'm saying what is your life going to do? It's going to manifest that in your life. You have to pay attention to what you're thinking about. And so throughout the, throughout the week, if you were really honest with yourself, how often do you think about the kingdom and the things that are above? How often do you think about the things that truly matter in our life? Do you dwell upon those things? And Paul is telling us, hey, you need to bring your life into alignment with what's happened in here. And the first step is make sure that you're thinking about the right things. You know, I love this uh, quote by John Mark Comer. He says, because what you give your attention to is the person you become. Put another way, the mind is the portal to the soul. And what you fill your mind with will shape the trajectory of your character. In the end, your life is no more than the sum of what you've given your ten attention to. Like if you're, if you're honest with yourself, which sometimes is really hard. It's hard to be honest with yourself. Sometimes we just want to ignore things, but if you're honest with yourself throughout the week, what does your mind dwell upon? What do you think about? What do you think about during the day? When you woke up this morning, what did you think about? When you go to bed at night, what did you think about? 
Because your mind's role, its job, is to bring it into reality. It's going to make it real in your life. And Paul's addressing this right here. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. And he continues on. He says, for you've died and your life is hidden with Christ and God. And when Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. And notice here, he says what? Put to death. So he started with the heart. Like, if, 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 you, if you're not first born again, then you're going to view all the things that I'm telling you as, a, as an effort for salvation, a method for salvation. That's not what Paul is addressing. He addressed that earlier. He's saying that if you truly are born again, there's going to be a new desire inside of you. And this is how I, this is how I, I, I kind of tell people, if you have no desire inside of you to do that which is right, that you have no desire for the kingdom of God, if you have no desire for righteousness or holiness, I absolutely think you should question if you're truly born again or not. Because that desire is not something that you work up. The scripture says that it's the spirit of God who works in us the will and the what? Desire to do that which is good. No man can come to me unless my spirit draws him. What we start off here is with the heart. Your heart has to be born again. And once it's born again, we have a responsibility. Say responsibility. responsibility. To partner with the spirit of God and put to death our old man. And so first, you're born again. Second, you get your thoughts right. Three, now you partner with what the Holy Spirit is trying to do in your life, and you put to death the old man. He says here, put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you? Sexual immorality. I'll talk about these here in a second. Impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. So I would say, would you agree with me that you and I have a responsibility here? To do what? To put to death the old man. You have been given an assignment to make sure that you're putting to death the old man inside of you. And we got to realize that spiritual maturity is not automatic. You don't just drift towards holiness. You don't just fall into fellowship or relationship or friendship with God. It has to become a pursuit of your life. It has to become something that you partner with in your life. Saying, I will partner with the work of the Holy Spirit in my life to make sure I see the fruit of the kingdom manifested in my life. And a lot of times we're frustrated with our life and the outcome of our, of our life. And we think that God should be doing something when what he's doing, he's inviting you to partner with him to put to death the old man in your life. I love what D.A. Carson says. He says, people do not drift towards holiness. Apart from grace-driven effort, people do not gravitate towards godliness, prayer, obedience to scripture, faith, and delight in the Lord. Let's, let's just stop there for a second. Do any of you drift towards that? No. Like, Sometimes I, I, I know there was a season in uh, uh, the church world and maybe in life in general where everyone was using that word organic. I just want, I want things to be organic, just happen. I want friendships to be organic, just happen. I want, I want my relationship with the Lord, Lord just to be organic and just to happen. The only thing that just happens in our life is just, is just sin. Like people say, I just want organic community. I don't think you're ever just going to happen to show up at the same place with someone. It takes what? Intentionality. Be organic about your job. If you took the amount of attention you gave your job and gave it to the Lord, your job would probably die. Reverse that. If you gave the amount of attention that you give your job to the Lord, your relationship with the Lord would probably pro progress and be amazing and if you gave the amount of attention that you give to the Lord in your relationship with him and your intentionality with him and you, get, and, 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 and you gave that, I've lost myself. <laughs> you get the point? <laughs> Jeez, a wheeze. But the reality is, is we're successful in the areas that we give our attention to. 
And so he's saying here, you need to give it focus. He says, we drift towards compromise and call it tolerance. We drift towards disobedience and call it freedom. Man, we drift towards superstition and call it faith. We cherish the indiscipline of lost self-control and call it relaxation. Just, this is, I'm just going to relax. I just need to sit back. We slouch towards prayerlessness and delude ourselves into thinking we have escaped legalism. We slide towards godlessness and convince ourselves we have been liberated. And so the danger is, Paul is saying, hey, you don't, you don't need to add to what Jesus' complete work in your life, what he's done. But at the same time, that doesn't give you the freedom to do whatever you desire, what you want. And I love what uh, Dallas Willard says. He says, grace is not opposed to effort. Listen to me. Grace is not opposed to effort. It is opposed to earning. You don't earn salvation. But it doesn't excuse you from partnering with what, the God, with, with what God's wanting to do in your life. You know, in Titus, Titus chapter 2, verse 11 through 12, it says, For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people. And what's that next word? Training. Everyone say training. Training, training us to do what? Accept? No, renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age training us it means to educate to teach to discipline renounce is that you disown it and i always have the saying especially when it comes to raising kids someone's always training someone and if you're a parent and you have a toddler you definitely know that someone is always training someone either the toddler's training you or you're training him or her. Even with culture, someone's training you or you're training it. And so the question is, is what spirit, is it the spirit of this age or the Holy Spirit is training you right now? And the way you answer that is, is your, are your current habits, behaviors, and actions looking more like Jesus or more like the world. And that you and I have a responsibility to imitate Christ and not this world. Do you follow me? He says here to put this fruit of what's earthly to death, sexual immorality, which is any sex that's outside of God's design and God's design is a man and a woman committed together in a marriage covenant. Anything outside of that, whether it's heterosexual, homosexual, panosexual, bestosexual, I don't care what it is, is out of God's design in its sin. Impurity. Impurity is more than just a sexual term here, it means mixture. So it's, it's any thought, behavior, action that's not pure unto the Lord, it's mixed with the world. Passion is, is a, the best way to put it is it's weak-willed. You're undisciplined, it's weak-willed, uncontrolled desire. You always give in to whatever you desire. Evil desire is similar. Covetousness is, this is interesting. This is when our, our desires become our idols, where we'll even use people, things, and even God to gratify our own wants. Like your relationship with God, James touched on this in his letter. He says that even what you pray for, you don't get because you pray and seek him for your own desires, right? So there's a tendency for some individuals that even your relationship with God has nothing to do with God, it has everything to do with you wanting to use him to get what you want. That's idolatry. And there's a tendency, especially in this world and society today, 
that we covet all these different things and it pulls us into idolatry because it's what we think about, it's what we pursue, it's what we lust after. And I can't help but think some of it is because we're constantly gazing upon other people's lives on Instagram and social media and all these other things and putting our heart in a state of want all the time. Whether it's Pinterest, whether it's Instagram, whether it's Facebook, once again, what are you doing? You're setting your thoughts on earthly things. And so then it puts your heart in a state of discontent, and then that's what you run after and you pursue. And so Paul is telling us, you need to put these things to death. And then he says, he says, hey, on account of these, the wrath of God is coming. The wrath of God. No one likes talking about that, right? I think the reality is here is that there's a, there's a passive wrath and there is an active wrath. And what I mean by that is a passive wrath, I think is what we see in Romans chapter 1, 24 through 32. I, I believe I gave it to them. If you want to turn there for a second, I want to show you what I mean by this. It says, therefore, God gave them up in the lust of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who, who is blessed forever. Amen. So see, he, he, he gave them over to it. So this is, this is not the final wrath, the final judgment, but he's handing them over to the decisions that they, or to the things that they want. Verse 26, for this reason, God gave them up to dishonorable passions. For the women exchanged natural relations for those that are contrary to nature. And the men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another. Men committing shameful, shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty of their error. And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness. So what they're experiencing is the idea of, of walking away from God and embracing their own lustful and earthly desires. So this is not the final judgment, but they're experiencing it. They're experiencing what life is like outside of the will of God, outside of the hand of God. It says, they were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. They are gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. Though they know God's righteous decree that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but give approval to those who practice them. And you'll see if you go back to verse 18, in that same chapter, it says, for the wrath of God is being revealed, is revealed. And so the reality, there's this, this, this passive way that we experience God's judgment. And it's, it's the result of walking in sin. And then we see these things, what we see happen in our life is a manifestation. Uh, I'll give it a simple term of hell in our life a breakdown of hell in our life. We see it in cultures, we see it in societies, we see it in nations, we see it in individuals' lives, and we see it in families. That as you begin to, to walk away from the basic principles of scripture, as you begin to walk away from acknowledging and honoring and loving God, then God says, if that is what you want, then I'll hand you over to it. You can have what you want. You can have me or you can have hell. So the reality is some of the, the devastation and the destruction and the, the error that we're experiencing in our life is the result of our own decisions to walk out of his will, to do our own things. And then there's the active wrath of God. And I think it's just, it's just sobering to read it. So we'll read it. Revelation 20, because I don't think the wrath or judgment of God's talked about much in church. And it's a reality that we all need to understand it's coming whether you want it to or not. Just like tax day, right? So <laughs> Revelation 20, chapter, or chapter 20, verse 11 says, Then I saw a great white throne, and him who was seated on it from his presence, earth and sky fled away, and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. Then another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged 
by what was written in the books according to what they had done. And the sea gave up the dead who were in it. Death and Hades gave up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each one of them, according to what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. This is God's active wrath, active judgment. When his patience has ran out. And when he returns to judge all things. And what I find kind of sad many times, and you can work this out with scripture yourself, you can work this out with the Holy Spirit. But it's in verse 6 where he says, on account of these, the wrath of God is coming. And what I I find disheartening so many times is how often churches and Christians will embrace the very things that, that God's going to bring his wrath for. We entertain ourselves. I know I'm on it a lot. I know I say it a lot. You're probably tired of hearing it. Jeremy, you always say this, but I'm just surprised how many times we may not partake in something, but we entertain ourselves with it. And the things that break God's heart and that wrath is coming for, we say, hey, I'm not taking part in it. I'm just watching it. And I think what we need to do is realize, hey, God wants our thoughts. He wants our actions. He wants our heart. He wants all of us. That we need to yield all of it to him. Verse 7, he continues. He says, in these, you too once walked when you were living in them, but now you must. Everyone say must. Must. Doesn't seem like an option, does it? He's telling you, hey, you must put them away. And once again, we think that spiritual maturity is just packed passive. It's just automatic that one day you'll wake up and you'll be more patient and loving and kind and all these different things. Paul is telling us here that you need to put these things away because you're no longer identified with them, which is anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. That you need to be aggressive and put those away. Then he moves on. He says in verse 9, he says, do not lie to one another seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the what? New self. Now this, I think this is, I'm going to spend some time here because I think it's an interesting choice of words. He says, which is being what? In what? After who? Okay, so he's saying, which is, so the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. The reason I think this is interesting, and I want to take a second here, is that word renewed is reestablished. It's, it's, your, it's your new identity. It's an identity. It's who you are in that it's being formed based on knowledge. And that word knowledge there is a personal acquaintance with. And so what I, I, I believe here is what's happening is that our lives our identity, who we are, is a manifestation of who we're in relationship with here in our innermost being. And what I mean by that is for some of you, your manifestation of your life is anxiety and fear and worry because here in your heart of hearts, that's what you're personally acquainted with. Your life is a manifestation of the image that you hold here, of what you're intimate with here. And so what happens is here, we don't surrender to God. Here, we're intimate with fear. Here, we're intimate with past wounds. Here, we're intimate with anxiety. Here, we're intimate with lust. Here, we're intimate with unforgiveness and bitterness. So what's manifested in our life is those things. And so the way that you change what you're manifesting in your life is to change what you're intimate with here, what you've given your affections to here, what you ponder here, the image that you behold here. That word knowledge is not just head knowledge. It's personal acquaintance. Like you can't change by just having net head knowledge of God. You change when you surrender here in this heart right here. And that as you behold him, as you're intimate with him, as you set your affections upon him, as you surrender your heart, your life will begin to change. And that all you're doing in your life right now is you're imitating what you're intimate with right here. 
And so some of us, you try your best to do what's right, but the reality is, is right here, you haven't surrendered to him yet. You're not intimate with him here. You're not beholding him here. And I think what Paul says here next, in verse 12, he says, put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved. Like he's, he's speaking to our identity, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another. And if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And this is what I think is important. All of it's important. But it says, and let the, what? The peace of Christ do what? Rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ do what? Dwell in you richly. How do I change? It's by staying in that peace here. Now let me unpack this. How do you stay in that peace here? By allowing who to rule there? Christ. You got to realize that a, 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 a kingdom is a king's domain. So a kingdom reflects the king. That in the kingdom, all the, the ways of, of living, the behaviors, is a reflection of the king. So you can't get the kingdom of God, his peace, in your heart without having him the king of your heart. And so peace is only a result of him being the king of your heart. It, peace is only the result of you and I surrendering every area of our life to his leadership. You don't get peace without the king. Do you follow me? And so what you want to do is in your heart, you want to stay in peace with him. And how do you do that? By staying surrendered and yielded to him in your heart. I'm not talking about just things on the outside. I'm talking about right here. You're, you're living under someone's kingdom. The question is, are you living under the King Jesus Christ's kingdom? And you only do that by allowing his word to rule in you richly, which is you live in obedience and surrender to him in every area of your life. Do you follow me? So you're manifesting in your life, the manifestation in your life is a direct, direct result of the king right here. And so if I was to ask you this question, if you thought about it around you right now in your family, in your relationships, in your life, what you're manifesting, what you're imitating, does it look more like hell? What's earthly? Or does it look more like what's heavenly? Does it look like Christ? If, if you're, you're, you're those closest to you were, were to assess your life and say, yeah, they, they imitate Christ, or do they imitate something else? And what Paul was telling us here is, yeah, you don't earn salvation, but you have a responsibility to partner with the leadership of the Holy Spirit in your life and to yield and to surrender every area of your life to him. Do you follow me? And I know sometimes when you talk about holiness or you, you speak about sanctification, there's a, there's a temptation to be like, oh, oh Jeremy, but, but you, you just can't, I feel condemned and beat up and, and all those different things. No, it's called conviction. And too many times we want to call conviction condemnation so we don't have to change. So we don't have to do anything different. 
And Paul is telling us that you have a responsibility to put to death earthly things inside of you and to allow the peace of Christ to rule in your hearts. And so if you don't have peace in your life right now, you gotta ask yourself, am I surrendering and yielding every area of my life to his leadership, to what is he wanna do? Amen. Let's stand. I'm gonna ask the prayer team to come forward. If you need prayer for anything, they want to pray with you. And I want to, I want to pray over us before I let you go. I just ask the Holy Spirit to, to really speak to our hearts right now. I ask the Holy Spirit to highlight areas. I ask the Holy Spirit to do what he loves to do and that's to make known Jesus and make much of Jesus. And I pray that we would be a church who don't just look submitted on the outside, externally, but it's in our hearts that we yield and we submit to you, Lord. Holy Spirit, I pray that you visit us. I thank you for your growth and your maturity in our lives. I thank you for your love. I thank you for your leadership. Come on right now, just say, I'm gonna ask you to ask the Holy Spirit to lead you. I don't wanna tell you to repeat after me and then you'll know what I'm gonna say. Just say, Holy Spirit, lead me. Show me. Direct me. I surrender to you. And right now, I think the Holy Spirit's gonna begin already to show you certain areas that you haven't surrendered yet. And throughout this week, I pray that the Holy Spirit will highlight areas for you that need to be surrendered. For some of you, that's anger. For some of you, that's anxiety, fear. but that he would lead you this week and that your relationship with God wouldn't be just something that's in the head, but it'd be something that's lived out from the heart. That the Holy Spirit would invite you into a deeper, deeper relationship with him. Guys, I'm telling you, I'm telling you the invitation is available, it's there. He's calling, he says, seek him while he may be found. Seek him while he may be found. In Jesus' name we pray. Come on, let's put our hands together. Amen. Love you guys. We'll see you next week. Thank you so much for joining us today. We hope that today's service was an encouragement and a blessing to you. And we would love for you to share it with your friends and family. If you have any prayer requests, testimonies, or anything you'd like to share, send us an email at hello at verticallife.church or reach out to us on any of our social media platforms. We hope you guys have an awesome week. See you next time.